In the midst of the tumultuous years of the Second World War, an often overlooked group of heroes ventured into the vast expanse of the world's oceans. These were the merchant sailors, courageous men who embarked on perilous journeys to ensure the uninterrupted flow of vital supplies. Braving treacherous waters, enemy attacks, and the fury of nature, they risked their lives to keep the lifelines of global trade intact. Through their unwavering determination and selfless acts, these forgotten warriors made an indelible impact on the outcome of the war. This is the untold story of the merchant sailors of World War II, whose resilience, bravery, and sacrifices remain an inspiration to this day. Felix Reisenberg, an experienced sailor and writer, once reflected, In those times, the seafarer of the merchant vessels was considered a ruffian to Americans. Notorious for poor quality whiskey, wharf fights, and sudden strikes that delayed massive passenger ships in New York, New Orleans, and San Francisco, they were a distinct breed. This was a time when the United States was only just beginning its engagement in World War II, while Nazi Germany had already brought the war to the nation's doorstep with alarming outcomes. U-boats wreaked havoc on merchant shipping along the U.S. East Coast and Gulf Coast, launching attacks on vessels within eyeshot of Virginia, North Carolina, and Florida beaches, and at the Mississippi River's mouth. America was too understaffed and ill-prepared to safeguard its own coastline. The glow of American coastal cities served as the perfect backdrop for U-boats to silhouette merchant vessels, making them easy targets for torpedo strikes, akin to ducks in a fairground shooting game. Aboard these ships were not armed forces but merchant mariners, civilian volunteers from the U.S. Merchant Marine, transporting critical war supplies for the Allies. These mariners formed the lifeline that delivered nearly all the necessities required by Allied armies to survive and continue the fight on foreign soil. While these sailors lacked military status or government benefits, they were endowed with a unique brand of bravery and sacrificed their lives for their nation just as valiantly as their counterparts in the military. Enduring a U-boat assault often required navigating a hazardous labyrinth of threats, including fires, explosions, frigid waters, sharks, burning oil slicks, and extensive journeys in exposed lifeboats. Taking a risk was the norm indeed, reminisced Jack Rowe, a merchant seafarer from the small Gwynn's Island in Matthews County, Virginia. There were countless others gambling their lives. One couldn't simply question, why should it be me? Keeping watch on a merchant vessel was anxiety-inducing, particularly during twilight and dawn, when the hues of the ocean and sky coalesced into a gray mist, and any hint of movement or splash of color could signify a torpedo's trail. Now and then, someone would succumb to their nerves, and could be seen pacing the deck in the night when they ought to be resting, remembered sailor Raymond Edwards. Once a torpedo made contact, every second was invaluable and each choice was permanent. A mere two-second delay could make the difference between survival and fatality for any crew member. Running the wrong way could block a seaman's only escape route. Leaping into the sea at an ill-timed moment or in an inappropriate place could be fatal. If a sailor is fortunate enough to survive a torpedo strike, it necessitates swift thinking and immediate action to get him off the ship and into a lifeboat. Many are rescued by pure chance. The U-boat warfare proved exceptionally harsh for merchant mariners. With the highest casualty rate of any military division, the Merchant Marine lost 9,300 men, predominantly in 1942, when most merchant vessels navigated U.S. waters with minimal or no U.S. Navy protection. In March 1942 alone, 27 ships belonging to six Allied countries were sunk off the coast of the U.S. In terms of statistics, America's coastal waters were the deadliest, accounting for half of the global sinkings. The incidence of torpedo strikes was so frequent that the Boston Seamen's Club president initiated a 40-fathom club for survivors. I hope the membership won't swell too much, he commented, but daily it expanded as rescue vessels brought oil-drenched survivors to the ports at Halifax, Boston, New York, Norfolk, Moorhead City, Miami, and Havana. Many of the mariners who survived such attacks promptly returned to sea, often traversing the same hazardous waters, only to be torpedoed once more. One seafarer was struck by torpedoes ten times. Nevertheless, the American public held mixed feelings towards the members of the 40 Fathom Club despite their sacrifices. Given the high demand for mariners, shipping companies lowered their standards, filling their crews with alcoholics, loafers, criminals, fighters, and card cheats. 
The image of the merchant marine was further tarnished by the existence of communists within the maritime unions, even though most mariners had little interest in radical politics. However, some naval leaders criticized them for resisting military discipline. Additional detractors lamented that the mariners' wartime bonuses elevated their wages above those of military personnel, neglecting the fact that mariners did not receive any governmental benefits, were subject to income taxes, and only earned their wages when their ships were at sea. If their ships were torpedoed, their wages ceased the moment they plunged into the water. Swimming for survival was off the clock. Additionally, their civilian status excluded them from lifelong military benefits including health care, educational funding, and low-interest loans. Nonetheless, not all perspectives on the merchant marine were negative. President Franklin D. Roosevelt lauded the mariners in his speeches, and his wife Eleanor acknowledged their extraordinary bravery and proposed they be given uniforms. Helen Lawrenson, a columnist for Collier's Magazine, ventured into a dingy sailor's bar in Greenwich Village and found herself charmed by a set of mariners who used pseudonyms such as Lowlife McCormick, No Pants Jones, Screwball McCarthy, Foghorn Russell, Soapbox Smitty, Riff Raff, and Whiskey Bill. Among the dozen mariners she encountered, ten had been torpedoed at least once, and one of the remaining two lamented, I feel so out of place, I'm a wallflower, a nobody. Despite their unglamorous appearance guzzling tremendous and daunting quantities of beer while singing coarse sea ballads, Lawrenson discovered a deeper layer of profound patriotism, nonchalant bravery, and worldly wisdom. They were the most informed, the most widely traveled, and the most genuinely worldly men I have ever encountered, she concluded. The New York Times portrayed merchant mariners as the overlooked heroes of the war. Nobody approaches to offer them a drink at the bar, no teary-eyed elderly women address them in the subway to whisper, God bless you. The street patrol officer, lenient with the inebriated soldier or the wobbly sailor, is likely to use his baton on a merchant sailor who has indulged excessively in the town's taverns to commemorate his sea rescue. The majority of mariners who braved the U-boat threat are no longer with us. The remaining few thousand have come to perceive Memorial Day as a commemoration that has never wholly recognized them. However, it's still not too late to acknowledge, even if tardily, our significant debt to them. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. See you soon.